Welcome back once again to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right here on Liberty Works Radio Network. And once again, I have to thank you for being with me, Tom Navolis, your host. Today, it's almost like a Rush Limbaugh day, even though I don't particularly care for Rush, except as a showman. And he does bring up some interesting ideas, and you know, there are times that... Uh, well, he's got some good stuff to say, and he does take a, a stand and a strong position. But let's not forget that uh, he has a whole staff that puts a bunch of things together, and he has uh, others that he has to uh, kind of pay attention to for his sponsorships and so on and so forth. But, you know, that being said, I think what I really meant by that is you may hear some crinkling of paper or jiggling of paper or flipping through a book or a little uh, slow things here and there as I move from a piece of material to another. Today, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is uh, something interesting. Once again this week, we have had a mass shooting, and uh, at the point that I'm bringing this to you, I, I don't know the details, and I'm not going to even try and surmise all of the details around that because that's not the point. The point is that our anti-federalist friends had it right. And that's what I'm bringing to you here on Liberty Works Radio Network, where liberty does work for you. And this being a, uh, a you know listener-funded station, I, I don't have to play to the ideas of uh, what a sponsor would be interested in or not interested in. I'm speaking freely. And what we're going to speak freely about today are the ideas uh, from the Constitutional Convention as it was wrapping up and as we look into what Madison's notes had to say, even from the time frame of uh, September 4th. Uh, and even before that, we're going to go to about August 15th and talk a little bit about uh, citizenship for immigrants, uh, what that discussion was all about, the ideas that uh, were for and contrary to and, and trying to establish what our founders intended for citizenship. You see, uh, over the course especially of these last hundred years, it is my firm and absolute belief if we did not have to contend with the socialist, communist, um, progressives, liberal-minded, uh, irreligious that promoted uh, an idea of religiousness, uh, pacifist, and so on, and really actually understood and taught what our founders intended, especially around immigration, especially around uh, having a tie of faith uh, into what it would be for active governance, I don't think we'd have a lot of the problems. You see, our, our present administration has it absolutely wrong in that uh, any type, and as you, I'm going to stop a second and kind of revert back, that any form of religion that brings a totalitarian perspective uh, to it, what that does is it means that it would be tyranny and it is against the very foundations of this nation. So a idea that a person, as our founders intended, would be allowed to worship God according to their conscience, when they considered that, they considered that from the biblical Judeo-Christian and even preferably from a Reformation Puritan perspective, uh, they never, ever, ever, ever considered the onslaught of Islam in particular, as something that would work in our constitutional republic. It has no place there. Can individuals take and worship uh, their idea of religion? Our founders said, yeah, we, we would allow for that. But in mass, they had no capacity to be engaged in their uh, tyrannical especially Sharia jihadist format within the context of our republic. Not only that, and uh, to some extent, there was a real you know, tough battle 
for our Catholic friends, because at that time there were those who really believed that because of the way that Catholicism was in those uh, you know 16 and 17 hundreds, that they had an absolute allegiance to the Pope and therefore could not have an allegiance into the United States of America. And what that interest, that context of all of that was developing was the idea that the, the, they would have a greater allegiance to the state of the Vatican under the Pope as their not only religious leader, but as their earthly leader, that then they could not have true allegiance uh, to the United States and what we were doing in a constitutional republic. So as, that is exactly why Thomas Jefferson said that the uh, Islamist could never be friendly to America, could never be an ally to America because of their Sharia ideas of law and their tyrannical form of government in that. So let's now take this around a little bit and wrap it back with, you know, some of that being a context of the discussion, but not being the hard rock base of it, except that if any form of religion leads to an anti-Christ form of tyranny, then it is outside of our founder's intent constitutionally for this republic. Uh, so what became an interesting argument and discussion in August 9th as that conversation was going on uh, regarding citizenship and immigration, the idea came about that uh, they initially talked about the, to insert 14 years uh, of uh, citizenship that someone had to be there to qualify, especially for the Senate. Now, the, this discussion just really went on and that uh, the likes of Governor Morris uh, he said that, you know, he moved to insert that, urging that the danger of admitting strangers into our public councils w was very critical. Because if someone did not truly assimilate into our culture, into our understanding of our Republican form of government with our Christian ideas and beliefs, they would bring their foreign influences in and would take and destroy, I mean really destroy, what our republic was all about. And that's what a lot of our founders were arguing during this period of time. You know, and Mr. Ellsworth opposed a motion discouraging meritorious aliens from emigrating to the country. Sure, there would be some good people that would come in, but we're talking about in the Senate, which they had a real problem, a number of them really had a real problem with, we'll talk about a little bit later as the, the Senate is to have the power of making treaties and managing our foreign affairs, there's a peculiar danger and impropriety in opening the door to those who have foreign attachments. This is what uh, Mr. Pickney uh, was talking about. He said, you know, that, 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 that there would be these jealousy, jealousies, as in the Athenians, on the subject of uh, who made uh, it, it intrusive for a stranger to have a voice inside a legislative uh, proceeding. Not only that, the Athenians, if it was a stranger, they made that person be put to death. Wow, that's pretty radical. And, and that's what Pickney was saying. And, and, and then Colonel Mason jumped in and he goes, you know what, uh, he highly approved of the policy of the motion. Uh, were it not that many of the natives of this country had acquired great merit during the revolution, he should be for restraining the eligibility into the set, only to natives, natives being those born in America solely. No different than what came out around the president saying you had to be a Native American. So too was it true for even the Senate that that's where Mason was all about. Madison was adverse to the restrictions. Uh, he thought that any restriction, however, in the Constitution is necessary and improper because the national legislature is to have a right of regulating naturalization. And that was part of all that argument. And uh, by virtue, could fix the periods of residence and consideration of enjoying different privileges of citizenship in the future. So we have to stop right there with that. So Madison, one of the key architects of the Constitution, and his ideas and intent were that even in his older age, when he went back and modified some of his comments, it was always that Congress has the right 
not the president, not an administration, not a bureaucracy, but only Congress, the legislature, has that right to fix the conditions of residency and the privileges that go along with that. So this argument that this usurper talked about on the 14th Amendment uh, this past week and, and even in the week before, uh, he's manipulating truth, he's manipulating history, and he's re manipulating what constitutional intent is actually all about. And so once again, when you have a usurper, that is what they're fundamentally all about, is manipulating truth uh, and telling those lies in such a way that it convinces other people that, oh, everyone else that knows the truth is absolutely wrong. That's the dialectic of the communist. That's exactly what the communist dialectic is all about, is to manipulate truth in such a manner and belittle the opposition in such a way that the lies become the truth. And that's what we're dealing with. So anyway, we just can kind of continue with that argument of August 9th of uh, that period. And what we're seeing is that Mr. Butler was decidedly opposed uh, to the admission of foreigners without a long residence in the country. And he was saying here, they bring with them not only attachments to other countries, but ideas of government so distinct from ours that in every point of view they are dangerous. He acknowledged that if he himself had been called into public life within a short time after his coming to America, his foreign habits, opinions, and attachments would have rendered him an improper agent in political and public affairs. He mentioned the great strictness observed in Great Britain of that time regarding uh, foreigners. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's a guy that is in the convention who says that when he first came to this country, if he was that person that was elected to office, he couldn't do it appropriately because he had too much of his foreign influence that he would bring into what he would try to happen inside the legislature. So not only are we seeing this in the ideas of what goes on in our legislature, but when we have then that electorate that has no true idea of what our constitutional republic is truly historically about, then we have people that vote in the ways that we have them voting. Not only that, when you start placing people into the bureaucratic offices as this usurper has done and bring in jihadist and communist very, very clearly into the various areas of his administration, then, ladies and gentlemen, what you're getting is all of the influence of that that is absolutely detrimental to our form of government. Hey, you know what? That is exactly what our framers of the Constitution were talking about. They were clearly defining that you can't have foreigners of that nature, people that have all of these other attachments in the areas that we have them today. Governor Morris, he talks about the lessons we are taught is that we should be governed as much by our reason and as little by our feelings as possible. What is it that modern politicians pressure on? What is it that the progressive use with their dialectic? They move on feelings. Whereas the language of reason on this subject, what is it? You know, it should be expressive. It should be that type of thing that looks at it. You know, we need to look at what we are doing as a people. You know, he, he kind of sums things up and he says, as those philosophical gentlemen, those citizens of the world, as they call themselves, he owned, he did not wish to see any of them in public councils. He would not trust them. The men who can shake off their attachments to their country can never love another. These attachments are the wholesome prejudices which uphold all governments. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have is when you have people that are world government people, they hate America. That's what he was saying. Very, very simply, they hate America and they do not belong in any format within the context of our government. Come on back in the next segment of Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right, and we're going to talk some more about the convention 
and uh, some other ideas from these uh, founding and fathers and framers of the Constitution. Look forward to seeing you in a few minutes. Minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns, that anti-federalist. You know what? Those anti-federalists did get it right. Those that argued against uh, the Constitution of 87 had some insights into what we're living into today. Yep, this is Tom Navolis, your host, and welcome back to Liberty Works Radio Network and what we have going on where Liberty works for you. And once again, I have to mention, unlike uh, some of the other commercial applications that are out there in programs, this is a listener-funded network, and I do ask you to go consider looking at a number of the other hosts and what else is going on on this programming. I mean, this is reaching up and down the eastern uh, seaboard and uh, I think into the Midwest and some other locations as well. And thank you for all of those that are Internet listeners And we really appreciate, and I especially appreciate the fact that you're taking the time out on your Saturday to listen to this program. You know what? We got going in the last segment uh, talking about maybe wrinkling some paper and, you know, flipping through the pages of uh, the Anti-Federalist Papers and the Constitutional Convention debates and looking at a number of different items that are the root cause of the tragedies that are going on in this past week, the lies and subversion that are going on in this nation, all the way into the highest office uh, and into the highest levels of the bureaucracies. You know, it's just what it is. It's because uh, our core history is being manipulated by those who have studied it and called themselves uh, constitutional scholars for the sole purpose of destroying everything that our founders intended as truth. It's uh, nothing new. As a matter of fact, it was part of what uh, I was talking about in the last segment in regarding to, uh, was it for immigration? The arguments in August 9th of uh, the convention when they were discussing the whole issue of how long should someone be a citizen before they were allowed to enter into public office. In particular, they were you know, forming that conversation around the Senate, somewhat of what they would determine around the presidency. But uh, you know, just to kind of bring it all back around, the, the bottom line, and I'll bring some detail to it, but the bottom line is that if someone is not in this country for an extended period of time and has not assimilated to our foundational culture, truths, and framers' intent for this republic, then all they're going to do is destroy it. All they're going to do is find a means and way by which they will institute their own evils, their own desires, their own influence into what goes on in government. Hence, uh, we can sum up again what uh, Governor Morris was saying about we got to use some reason about uh, what it is, uh, what it means to become a citizen. You know, there are uh, there's moderation in all things. When we look at the subject of reason, he kind of talked about that moderation in that it said that uh, some tribes of the Indians carried their hospitality so far as to offer strangers their wives and daughters. Was this a proper model for us? He would admit them to his house. He would invite them to his table, would provide for them a comfortable lodging, but would not carry the complacence so far as to bed them with his wife. He would let them worship at the same altar, but did not choose to make priests of them. He ran over the privileges which emigrants would enjoy among us, though they should be deprived of that of being eligible to the great offices of government. Uh, Governor was uh, Morris was talking about this in such a way, observing that they exceeded the privileges allowed to foreigners in any part of the world, and that a every society, from the great nations down to a club, had a right for declaring the conditions on which new members should be admitted. There could be no room for complaint. You got that? So these illegals have no room at the table. These anchor babies have no room at the table. The manipulation of the 14th Amendment 
by the usurpers have no room at the table. They're not allowed, and there's no room for them to complain. Uh, Governor Morris's idea goes on to say, as to those philosophical gentlemen, those citizens of the world, and I'll stop here for a moment, yeah, that's right, the one-worlders, the world government types, the internationalist, uh, he continues with this, is that uh, those that would call themselves citizens of the world, he did not wish to see any of them in our public councils, that they, we would not see any of them in our public councils. He would not trust them. The men who can shake off their can't, the man, oh, excuse me, I, I read that wrong. The men who can shake off their attachments to their own country can never love any other. So what he's talking about is these globalists, they're, 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 they, they have no attachment to their country of birth. So how could they be attached to anything? That would be nothing. So the whole idea of the idea of globalism was something that our framers were dealing with. There's nothing new under the sun, ladies and gentlemen. This is the same old stuff. And they said there's no place for it. No place. And yet you have all of this one world government, these international businesses, all of that. I'm telling you. We have to look to America as America. We have to go back to our foundation as what it means for our Reformation, biblical, puritanical, what? Culture. What it meant for our founders to understand how our republic should work. Well, anyway, I'm getting off a little bit. Governor Morris continued, Governor Morris, he says, these attachments are the wholesome prejudices which uphold all governments. Uh, admit a Frenchman into your Senate, and he will study to increase the commerce of France. An Englishman, he will feel an equal bias in favor of that of England. It has been said that the legislatures will not choose foreigners, at least improper ones. There is no knowing that legislatures would do. There's knowing what, no, nothing. You don't know what they were going to do. Some appointments made by them prove that everything ought to be apprehended from the cabal practiced on such occasions. He mentioned uh, the case of a foreigner who left his state in disgrace and worked himself into an appointment from another to Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have here is the anti-federalist Governor Morris taking and bringing to light exactly what we have in America today. And I'm not flipping pages. I'm pounding the table because you know something? They saw it. They saw exactly what we have. We have so many of foreign ideas, not only in the legislature, we have communists in the legislature. You know, we, we, we have that very, very well documented by Trevor Loudon. You know, he brings it out very, very clearly who are the socialists and communists sitting in Congress. They have no intent, no heart for. And look at this Bernie Sanders guy. He is an absolute communist. And you know what? I heard on Fox Business on Thursday morning that he will introduce socialism so hard in America that it will turn the whole idea of what America is all about. And yet, what do you have? You have thousands upon thousands of people flocking to him because this other socialist called Hillary Clinton is taking and coming undone because of her deception, lies, and the evil that she promotes, and yet they flock to another form of evil because they do not understand what our founder's intent was for this country. And so it's so much more uh, interesting, so more attractive to go what I talked about in the last pro, uh, segment on feelings. It was, they said, you know, where's the reason? You can't go on feelings. That's exactly what Governor Morris was talking about. He said, the lesson we are taught is that we should be governed as much by our reason and as little by our feelings as possible. Yet we have people 
that are all caught up in their feelings because that's what they've been taught. They've been taught the touchy-feely stuff. They've been taught all this humanistic nonsense. They have not been taught how to think, how to reason, how to understand what our culture should look like and what our government should function as. As what? As a republic, a constitutional republic. Well, you know what? What we have instead is we have the socialist, the communist, the French, the lobbyist, the international businessman, the globalist, the jihadist that are doing what? Influencing every aspect of legislation. Because we have them sitting in every level of governance from local to the highest offices and points of reference in this nation. Is immigration important? Yeah. Is the person that uh, you know we're finding out about that on Thursday did the shooting, uh, calling out and saying, you know, are you a Christian? Boom, you get shot in the head. Uh, it, it, that is a jihadist activity. Is taking and having a president stand up and demanding more gun control? That's usurpation of our constitutional rights and the authority that we have as individual citizens and the collective body in this republic to defend ourselves. That's usurpation. That's tyranny. That's lies and deception. That is foreign influence, as many would think. I, you know, we can probably prove it more by assumption than by the weenies in Congress not willing to take and get in there and fight for the truth. That this usurper sitting in the presidency, you know, may not even be an American. Period. One thing I I will say, because of his attachments, his affinities, and his actions. By no means is he a Christian. You know what? The, the Bible says you'll be known by your fruits, and this guy's fruits are fruity. Uh, and, you know, quite frankly, he associates himself with the fruits and promotes the fruits over any ideas of Christianity. And we saw that in his last speech to uh, the... Uh, the, the uh, anyway, I'm not going to go down that path. The fact is, is that, you know, we have foreigners that have that major influence. So when we look at all of that... When we look at what immigration has to do, what that means, well, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a mess, especially with the reality and the fact that uh, you know this, con this, th this Congress is not standing up whatsoever in a way that they should to influence and take control over the administration so that we would have our republic uh, held to. You know, we, we just continue to go over and over with the ideas of, um, you know, the insanity, not just ideas, but the insanity of evil as it promotes itself and is allowed to. Um, I guess it's even more than just insanity. It is the uh, weakness of people that do not understand what is truth. Uh, so as I started going through, additionally, who was saying what relative uh, to all of this? I had to go look at Elbridge Gerry. And he was a vice president uh, during James Madison's administration. He signed the Declaration of Independence, but he was uh, refusing to sign the what? The Constitution. And why? Well, you know what? His primary reason was is that he complained that the Constitution would centralize too much power at the federal level. Oh my goodness gracious, what do we have today? We have such a, what, centralization of government through all the various agencies that is absolutely contrary to what true federalism is all about. The anti-federalists, as I've mentioned many times before, were the true federalists because that's what they promoted. That's what they intended. That's what they saw as what should happen. And Elbridge Jerry was very strong in that uh, respect. You know, he, he stood strong against a centralized government. And not only that, he just was a promoter and a, a, a stalwart in getting the Bill of Rights going. He and Samuel Adams and others out of Massachusetts really wanted to see that come forward. 
and uh, you know he found fault in what was going on with the offices uh, of the Senate. He knew that that would be all messed up and turn into an oligarchy leading to tyranny as it is today. Well, come on back in the next segment and join me as Samuel Adams Returns continues this conversation. Welcome back to this final segment of Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right, here on Liberty Works Radio Network with your host, Tom Novolis. And I thank you again for sticking with me as we continue the discussion of uh, what was happening at the Constitutional Convention and what was becoming predictive by some of the people that attended. We have to go back, and I'm going to kind of focus on Elbridge Jerry. We, we talked about Governor Morris. We talked about some of the responses, especially in the immigration debate on that thought process. Uh, there were a number of other issues that uh, came up towards the end of the convention that really got the uh, the framers sitting there going, what in the world was going on? I mean, there was opposition. Absolutely was, was opposition. And, you know, some of the people that opposed what was happening, and this came about on September 7th, the 10th, the 15th, were the likes of uh, Colonel Mason uh, was, was one of them, George Mason. And what uh, he looked at, uh, Mr. Randolph, uh, Mr. Jerry, uh, it just became very uh, interesting in per- how they pronounced what they thought would happen and what would occur uh, with this Constitution. And you know what? They were right. We're living it today to the extent that uh, you know Colonel Mason thought that the office of vice president uh, was an encroachment on the rights of the Senate. And it mixed too much uh, of the legislative and executive powers together. And, uh, you know, unlike the judiciary, and it should be separate. He definitely expressed his dislike and any reference to what the uh, power is and the appointment uh, such that would happen through it. Uh, On the other hand, he was adverse to uh, vest so, so much power in the president alone. He always thought there should be a privy council, six members, that would take and be chosen to uh, work with the president, and on and on. He had some other ideas around that. And uh, he thought that there was just too much of a relationship between the Senate and the appointment of ambassadors uh, with, the, uh, with the president. He saw, thought, saw that there was too many ties, especially in the idea of treaties and, and some of those ideas that would happen. Uh, Mr. Randolph uh, took his opportunity to state his objections to the system, and once again, uh, he turned uh, his attention to the Senate uh, being made the court of impeachment for trying an executive. And how could they do that when they were so tied based under the uh, treaty, based under what their powers were and the relationship that they would have within the context of the executive branch of government? And that was really interesting to see that, you know, we, we hear... Uh, many, and I, I actually heard several congressmen in, in talking with them personally, is that they would have loved to impeach uh, this president. But the Senate, being what it is, including the Republicans, there would be no way that there would be a judicious trial of a usurper in the Senate. It would, it would turn into nothing, and you would never get the impeachment uh, fully exercised because the Senate and its attachments at all the various levels across both parties uh, would not facilitate it. So, you know, you had this being talked about uh, by Colonel Mason and uh, then Mr. Randolph in particular. That was very interesting. And you could go into the details, and I'm not going to read all of this because I want to get to Elbridge Jerry in a little bit. But one of the things that Randolph really brought out was that under this whole idea of what was going on in the convention, uh, he said that uh, you know the judgments of the convention were such, and that but he must keep himself free in case he would be honored with a seat in the convention of his state to act according to dictates of his judgment. The only mode in which his embarrassment could be removed was that of submitting the plan to Congress to go from them to the state legislatures and from these to the state conventions, having the power to adopt and reject or amend the process 
to close with another general convention with the full power to adopt and reject alterations proposed by the state conventions. So what he was looking at was saying, wait a minute, you know what, we need to either offer amendments or, you know what, then when we, you can't do a take or leave it as the way that the Constitution left the convention. And that's really what it was. You adopt it or you don't adopt it. And guess what? When we hit nine, uh, it's going to get adopted and you're going to be forced to adopt it anyway. And he's going, no, we should have the ability to amend it even before it's adopted because it was missing so much. So when you talk that the Articles of, of Confederation were missing stuff, it was even worse in regards to liberty, rights, and all of that in comparison. And there were all the arguments between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists and the various news articles that uh, were promoted, and I've talked about that before. Colonel Mason came back and seconded and followed up with Mr. Randolph in uh, the dangers and powers of the structure of the government, concluding that it would end either in a monarchy or a tyrannical aristocracy, which he was in doubt, but one or the other he was sure would happen. So where are we today? You know, where, if you look at the Senate and its ties into the administration and how we have this usurper acting as almost a monarch and doing his phone and pen thing, what we have is, is you know, exactly what Colonel Mason was talking about right here. He, he was talking about a tyrannical aristocracy with the oligarchy of the Senate supporting the likes of a usurper as we have here in our administration today. Wow, pretty interesting stuff. And then Mr. Jerry, we're going to talk about him you know, in more detail because Jerry summed up a number of things when he was still in convention as to why he would not sign it. But I think the where it really takes and, and does justice is in the letter that he wrote uh, to the Massachusetts State Legislature as they were getting ready to go into convention. Why was Jerry against what was going on? So this one I'll take a little bit more detail and, and, and quote from it directly. You know, he had to start out by saying, Gentlemen, I have the honor to enclose, pursuant to my commission, the Constitution proposed by the Federal Convention. So he was a guy that actually submitted it to Massachusetts legislature. To this system, I gave my dissent and shall submit my objections to the honorable legislature. It was painful for me on the subject of such national importance to differ from the respectable members who signed the Constitution, but conceiving, as I did, that the liberties of America were not secured by the system, it was my duty to op oppose it. He thought right away, so I'm going to stop right here, that what? That the liberties of America were not secured by this system. What in the world? Uh, he continues on, my principal objection to the plan, that there is no adequate provision for a representation of the people that they have no security for the right of election, that some of the powers of the legislature are ambiguous and others indefinite and dangerous, that the executive is blended with and will have an undue influence over the legislature, that the judicial department will be oppressive, that treaties to the highest importance may be formed by the president with the advice of two-thirds of a quorum of the Senate, and that the system is without the security of a Bill of Rights. These are objections which are not local, but apply equally to all the states. Whoa, ladies and gentlemen. Whoa, 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 whoa. Think about that paragraph alone. If you dissect that paragraph and consider, first of all, representation of the people. Ladies and gentlemen, when the... the the Constitution was formed, what we had was an idea that there would be a representative for every 30,000 people. Now we have one representative for almost 2 million people. Are you really represented? Are you really heard? You know, I have the privilege and honor of knowing my congressmen and, uh, you know, having some level of confidence and, and, and discussion with him and, you know, great interactions so I may be a little bit more represented than my neighbor, 
who doesn't know him, who has no uh, affinity towards him, maybe, and he no affinity towards them, but is a generalist for his district. And maybe no fault of the congressman himself, but in general, the idea that we do not have a full representation of the body with which the intent of the republic was designed, we're, we're missing a lot of folks that should be sitting in the House of Congress. I mean, it should be huge. We, we need a whole new building to have Congress come into session. And uh, that, that's just interesting in and itself. And then when he talked about the security of election, uh, you know, Congress can take and change the election laws anytime they want to. They, they can do some things that the Anti-Federalists talked about. We have not seen that come to fruition, but that doesn't mean that it won't. And then some of the powers of the legislature are ambiguous, that being the likes of uh, the various clauses, the general welfare clause. Uh, that was described when you get into the details of the arguments of the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, what general welfare meant. And I talk about that in my uh, presentations and book on the tale of two constitutions. But you know what? The ambiguity of the language around some of those clauses is what causes the problems today when they wrap everything up and around and say it's all for the general welfare. Well, what does that mean? What does the general welfare mean? You don't know. I know, but I'm not going to get into it here. But the ambiguity that Jerry was talking about is exactly what we're living under today and the indefinite and dangerous components of what is being given as these powers, and that the executive uh, is a, a blended, and, it, and, and, and the influences that they have over the legislature, especially with the idea of the Senate. Oh, we can go on and on and, and, and go through the treaties. Ladies and gentlemen, treaties do not change the Constitution, but they become law, and to the effect they are inserted into the execution of the law by which becomes constitutional. You know, they're not amendments, they're treaties, but they have the same effect as if the Constitution itself had it written within it. This is dangerous. And then on top of that, what we have are these executive agreements like this Iranian deal. That has been given by the courts and by the legislatures credence that it should never have. So did Jerry call it right? Yep, I think he did. And then uh, he goes on, as the convention was called for the sole purpose and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation and reporting to Congress and the several legislatures such alterations and provisions as shall render the federal constitution adequate to the exegies of government and the preservation of the Union, unquote, that was the charter that they were given, I did not conceive that these powers extended to the formation of the plan proposed, but the convention being of a different opinion, I acquiesced in it, being fully convinced that to preserve the Union, an efficient government was indispensably necessary and that it would be difficult to make a proper amendments to the Articles of Confederation. The Constitution proposed has few, if any, federal features but is rather a system of national government. Nevertheless, in many respects, I think it has great merit and by proper amendments may be adapted to the exegies of government and the preservation of liberty. Did you get that? Did you clearly understand what he was saying? He was called an anti-federalist, but what he was saying there that the Constitution as it was proposed didn't have any features of what federalism is really all about. Ladies and gentlemen, he just continues to argue through what this was all about, the question of the plan and, and of highest importance, whether there should be a dissolution of the federal government, whether the several states' governments shall be so altered as to be dissolved, and whether in lieu of the federal and state governments, a national constitution now proposed shall be substituted without amendments. Never, perhaps, were the people called on to decide a question of greater magnitude. Should the citizens of America adopt the plan as it now stands with their liberties may be lost, or should they reject it altogether, an anarchy may ensue. It is evident, therefore, that they should not precipitate in their decisions that the subject should be well understood, lest they should refuse to support a government after having hastily accepted it. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we're at that point now where everything that Jerry and the other anti-federalists talked about, and I'll continue to bring this out in every program in one way or another, have come to fruition. And I look forward to continuing this conversation with you the next time at Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist got it right here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Work.